Hi, everyone, and welcome to Good Morning Sunshine. I'm one of your co-hosts, Brandon Lee, alongside my good friend and colleague, Carrie Pena. And today on this episode of Good Morning Sunshine, we are going to be focusing on shame. This is such an important topic, and we want to welcome our guests. Thank you so much, Dr. Robert Roten, who is the CEO of Arizona Trauma Institute. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. First of all, when we talk about shame, this is, this is a feeling that can really take over your whole body, and you sometimes don't even know how to identify this as shame. Can you start by talking about how impactful shame can be on our lives? Mm. Well, shame has multiple impacts. Uh, we have the impact uh, that it creates socially uh, with our connections and our attempts to attach. Um, when that doesn't happen very well, we tend to, the, the person feels shame because there's something wrong with me. I can't connect and it must be me. And that early experience uh, causes them to you know, kind of withdraw, hold back, and and not reach out, not try to connect as much. And unfortunately, um, in most societies, the the child that is withdrawing uh, when they feel unsafe or they are they're in a shame state, uh, instead of being engaged, is usually chastised and uh, or criticized or bullied. Um, and that further exacerbates it. When we experience childhood trauma, childhood shame, right? It impacts the wiring of our brains and we begin to misfire throughout our adulthood. And that's what triggers are, right? It's like, you know, you're in a workplace environment and you're like, God, this person is just rubbing me the wrong way, but I can't figure out why. Oftentimes it's a reflection of something that happened to us as children. How do we overcome that? How do we begin the process of rewiring that brain and healing from that? So the first piece is the person has to be able to regulate themselves. Because until you can regulate yourself, you don't get full access to your, to your neocortex. And then you have to practice developing increasing levels of awareness. I was interested in this article that you wrote and I wanted to touch on four points that you made here about trying to overcome and break through shame. And shame can come from so many different places. Yeah. You go through a divorce, a breakup, you know, so many things can cause us shame in our life. Um, identify shame's presence, discuss with someone, uh, learn to love yourself, and then you say, have confidence you will overcome. How, if you're going through a moment where you feel ashamed of what's going on, or perhaps if you've, you know, had some childhood trauma that you feel ashamed about, how do you then have confidence that you can overcome? This goes back to being able to regulate yourself. You know, um, regulating yourself so that you can access and really think through this stuff. Oh, I'm having that experience again. That's probably related to this. I can get through that. And... Uh, but you have to be able to stay in that executive functioning system and operate intentionally. And in other words, uh, you have to be able to step into the experience without being overwhelmed by it. And that really does require that we be fairly well regulated before you even try to do that. A lot of the folks that deal with shame clinically, um, particularly from a psychiatric point of view, tend to uh, want to start, a uh, you know, dealing with the shame before they've actually stabilized the client enough. I think that's such an important point you're making right now. It's crucial because if people go to seek help and they feel more ashamed when they do that outreach, and that can be just detrimental to healing. Can I expand on that a little bit for you? So you have a person that's feeling shame has spent a good portion of their life avoiding difficulty avoiding distress, trying to avoid and manage um, the discomfort that they're experiencing. And so almost everything in their nervous system is built to avoid. So they go into a mental health provider that lacks the understanding of that, and the, the person says, you need these big, wonderful goals. Let's work towards this goal. But nothing in their system is goal-oriented out there all of their system is built to avoid. Yeah, fight or flight. Well, it, to avoid. So you have to, if you're going to work with shame, you have to build interventions that help the person avoid in a more healthy way. 
instead of trying to sell this idea that there's this wonderful life out here because they can't buy that. Dr. They can't Rowan, even understand it. Where can people find out more about the Arizona Trauma Institute? We understand you're training now, what, upwards of 10,000 people per month. Pretty much. Where can people find out more? They can go onto our website, uh, you know, which is, or do a search for Arizona Trauma or you can search my name and they will pull up pages and pages. All of the stuff. things. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate you being here to talk about such an important topic. You're welcome. And as we continue our conversation right now on Good Morning Sunshine about shame, uh, I had a chance to sit down with a woman named Megan Racer. She's a director of business development at Camelback Recovery and has quite the story to tell herself. I had her on the podcast, Escaping Rock Bottom. Uh, she was a young mother. She was actually doing runs for the cartel over the border and was bringing her two children along with her when she was making those runs. As you're about to hear from this uh, clip from my podcast, she got caught at the border with her two kids and she was taken into custody. I go to cross. And when I cross, again, you know, the guy's not buying my story. He's like, go to secondary. And I go to secondary. And like we go inside and I look back and I see the dog like sit right down, right? And I, <laughs> I don't even know. Like I, I can feel, I can feel the feeling that I felt that day. Mm. Because it was just like, I thought it was just going to be routine. Like, I thought it was going to be the same way that it was when I went the first time. Just a normal crossing. We're going to go back. Like, I'm going to go on with life. Like, mm -hmm. I think mentally that's where I stopped. Yeah. So, yeah. That's where everything just got really different for me, you know? And, um, so I saw like everybody coming in <laughs> and I had like, of course I had drugs on me, like in my bra. Right. And I go to head in the bathroom to throw away and, you know, they're like, ma'am, you can't go in there. And, you know, they put me in this little room and, um, I'm like trying to hug, you know, my kids cause they're there. And this is the most like traumatic thing I can think to ever put like a small, a small child through. Right. And they're like you need to cooperate with us or we're just going to arrest you in front of them. Like, okay. So they grab them, they take them out and, you know, they handcuff me and they don't find like what I had on me. And, um, they're like, you know, we need, we need, um, contact information so somebody can get your kids. And I, I don't, I don't know why they didn't call CPS. <laughs> Cause like, I don't think I would have ever seen them again after that. <laughs> And like, I don't think it's shame that I care anymore, but it's so much guilt and it's so much like, just, I'm sorry. You know, I feel so sorry for my kids for putting them through what I put them through. Well, first off, I want to say I'm so proud of Megan. She's become a friend of mine. Uh, she works in the recovery community over at Camelback uh, Recovery. And, you know, she's in the process of still healing from all of that shame and, and the guilt that she had for you know, bringing her children and exposing them to those kinds of dangers. Uh, she has been in recovery for several years now, but it just proves the point that sometimes it takes a while in order to kind of go back and really begin to be regulated, stand in it, and then heal from it. It takes some time. And it takes a lot of courage, as the doctor was saying earlier, um, you know, to recover from shame, start talking about it. Right. And for her to tell that story now and, you know, be so brave, I really commend her for that. And she even said it was one of the first times she's broke down crying, mm. um, talking powerful. about it. So yeah. it was, she even said it was kind of the beginning of the breakthrough so she can address that. If you want to watch the entire episode, uh, you can watch it. It's on escapingrockbottom.com. Uh, we're going to continue on with our next guest, and I'm really excited to have Imet Damara here. She's the Associate Clinical Director over at Scottsdale Recovery Center. It's one of the premier treatment centers uh, in the entire state of Arizona because you guys are really doing what I call the true trauma healing work. Um, it's not just, oh, 30 days in and then we're going to let you go. And you guys have really developed programs because I met, we both know how much trauma is a leading cause of why people even begin to numb out. Why is that? The biggest reason is, you know, avoiding. They don't want to deal with the trauma that they had, whether it's childhood, whether it's in adulthood of any kind of matter, right? So 
coping is the biggest thing to deal with that. And sometimes coping isn't always great, right? So we're thinking, we're thinking substance abuse. Um, it's usually like the biggest thing people go to is because it kind of gets rid of the pain, kind of numbs it and gets rid of it. But generally it doesn't, right? It's still there, which begins the cycle of addiction, right? You continue, you use, you continue, and it's every day, and then it becomes months, then it becomes year, years. And so that trauma that happened when you were maybe 12 years old, um, still there when you're 30, you know? And then when you decide, hey, I need help, well, that's where the big treatment, and that's where the real treatment becomes. And it's really the work and the hard work that people need to do. What kind of lessons do you teach about shame at Scottsdale Recovery Center? Well, the biggest thing, you know, personally as a therapist myself, like I really focus on what is the client feeling right like so what's going on it's the first time they felt in years maybe um, I'm a huge feelings person I love to see emotion like I love to see when they you know feel pain and all of that and I know that sounds super you know harsh but it's because they've actually felt it for the first time um, they don't have a drug or alcohol to numb it and so we try to get through what's happened in their childhood so we do a lot of like history taking we discuss you know what's happened in their childhood or just recently what happened a year ago um, and identify what the situation is and then go from there. You know, you can't really, depending on the client, right, you can't just go from step one to step five. Sometimes you might go, you know, everywhere, but it just meet the client where they're at, kind of. How would you identify and define shame as a therapist? <sighs> I mean, shame is so different for everybody. Um, what shame might feel to me is not what, you know, you might see as shame, right? Just like trauma. All trauma is very different for all of us. Um, but one of the biggest things that I hear with shame is the hopelessness and the worthless factor. Um, I don't feel enough. I'm not enough. Um, that's what I constantly hear with clients. Um, I don't feel enough because this person made me feel like I wasn't enough or um, this situation made me feel like I wasn't enough. And now they're trying to figure out what is enough. Where am I going to get that feeling? And I think too, you, you touched on it, such an important message to send home is that we should never compare shames and we should never compare traumas with other people. Because what we're really actually trying to do is go, oh, she had it so much worse than I did, so I shouldn't be feeling this way. Like, get over it, is really what we're telling our inner child and we're telling ourselves, which is the worst thing we can do because trauma is trauma. It will impact our, our minds and our bodies in almost the exact same way regardless of what we perceive to be the severity of said trauma. The same thing is, is that we can't treat everyone who's experienced trauma the exact same way, which is not like, here's a playbook and here goes, oh, you experienced trauma, here's steps one through five and it's gonna work for everybody and you know that not to be true. So I love talking about different modalities that you guys offer at Scottsdale Recovery Center to help people go back and do that reprocessing work. You know, we go from CBT, you know, to DBT and just really just a lot of, um, person-centered therapy as well. I mean, personally, I do a lot of just conversations. Let's, let's get the rapport building, really, and see how, because you have to get comfortable with the client. They have to get comfortable with you. To be vulnerable? Yes, yes. exactly. They've never been usually vulnerable exactly. in their life. Trust is a huge thing, so you have to build that trust. If you don't have trust, you're not going to get anywhere with that client, and so our big thing at Scottsdale Recovery Center is just being able to meet the client where they're at um, and being able to focus on helping them regardless of what that looks like. We want to help in any way. I meet a lot of people and they, you know, they say, I became an alcoholic when I was in my 50s, right? And I'm like, okay, well, what was your childhood trauma? What would you say with all the folks that, you, you know, we see in our um, substance use disorder world, would you say stems from unhealed childhood trauma? A lot of it is, you know, environmental factors and people, you know, that raised them a certain way, whatever that looks like. Um, culturally, personally, I can say, you know, I was taught kind of to not really talk about my emotions and feelings. Suppress That's it. not something that we do. Um, and so I learned very quickly that that was not a great thing to do. <laughs> and so I realized... Don't your dirty laundry. Exactly. Right? <laughs> um, kind of just be the independent person that you can, but also forget about the feelings that you've gone through. And it's like not the way I teach anyone to do because as much as people hate the feelings, you have to get through them to feel and actually, you know, you might not enjoy it and it's not fun, but you have to get through it in order to move forward. Thank you so much for being here and sharing all of your knowledge with us. Where can people find out more about your work? Um, we have a website, it's Costa Recovery Center. We have Indeed, we're on Indeed, we're on Facebook, we have an Instagram, so we're all over social media. You got media. it all covered. We and have levels, it all covered. And quickly, levels of care, residential through? So we have detox as well. Okay, detox right. residential, we have two residential homes, um, PHP, IOP, evening IOP. Yeah. So we have all. 
And Thank I always you. tell people, it's not the red, residential is all about stabilization. It's so important that when we speak about kind of healing yourself from substance use disorder, that mm -hmm. it's not 30 days and you're done. Right. 30 days is just the very, very beginning of a process because PHP and IOP are huge huge yes. components to the actual healing aspect. And I'm huge on just making sure that they don't focus on the number, right? Because they think 30 days I'm healed, absolutely not. Yeah. You know, we still gotta work on some things and yeah. that's okay, you know, I always push them to, it's okay to not be okay, right? And it's okay to, you know, not focus on the number and be able to just focus on the progress. All right. Thank you, so much. Thank Thank you, you so guys much. so much. We always like to end on our sunshine story and Christine, our executive producer, is here today to spread the sunshine. And she's always on social media <laughs> finding cool little clips and cool little trends up on TikTok and this is one of her trends. Um, no shame in the game. <laughs> no shame in her game at all. What's going on? What'd you find? So I love this uh, idea of there's no shame in trying. And performers really are the people that like put themselves out there in a vulnerable state. Musicians, actors, models, anybody who's like putting themselves in front of camera in a spotlight. And there's this really cool uh, trend. It's on 7.5 million people are like participating. And it's called roles that I auditioned for versus what I got. So it's this community building of, okay, I might have put myself out there for this, but then either somebody else got it, but it doesn't matter. Like it's, success, it's a success because you went out there. So it's this whole shame of not trying and mm. building that community idea because, yes. I mean, for me, I, I dabble in that realm as well. But sometimes I just don't even want to tell people like, oh, I went out for that part because there mm. is a follow up. Oh, did you get it? No. Oh, well, that's a good <laughs> right. point. Yeah. So it's like you have to be accountable for that. But now it's just like, good for you for going out. Like, oh, okay, so you didn't get it. Eh, who cares? You'll get another one. And it's it's highlighting that as being what to be proud of as opposed to the end result, perhaps. Yeah, and the, you know, the other thing too, you know, I being in LA and having a ton of friends there and a lot of them are actors, you know, and they, they go to all these calls. And at one point I was like, man, like how many times can you be rejected before you give up, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally it was just kind of flipped the script on me saying, hey, you know what, but each time you go out there it's a learning experience, right? It's not a wasted experience. It's a learning experience and you'll never get better unless you go out there and try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not only that, but you have to remember, do I even like doing this? Because if you're just nerve wracked and you don't like doing it, like, gosh, that's gotta be terrible. But I like being a ham. Yeah. <laughs> and having my picture taken. And you being think? the one, I know, <laughs> surprise. But it, that's, that's the reason why I do yeah. it. Because it's okay, because at the end of the day, I had fun while I was putting myself out there. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter if it didn't happen to me. I mean, it's not my bread and butter, thank goodness. But uh, it, it's important to try and to not like stop yourself from doing something because yeah. you're ashamed that it didn't turn out the way that, yes. that you thought. Do Super it because cool. you love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's a, it's a cool trend that people are kind of pulling back the wall of being like, you know what? I don't care that I didn't get it. Great for that actor or model who did get it, yeah. but uh, good for you for just putting yourself out there and having no shame it. in that game. I Great trending topic. Thank you yes. so much, Christina. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to all of you for watching Good Morning Sunshine. That's right. If you're here on YouTube, just go ahead and hit that bell notification sign. And as soon as we upload a new episode or a new podcast, you will get alerted by it. We'll see you back here for the next episode. Take care. <laughs>